Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth edition of the yeah, next economy, yeah, economy, yeah, economy, yeah, economy yeah, movement. <laughs> Sorry, I got the top 100 speaker, diversity innovator, crisis coach, pleasure activist, regenerative culture creator, and all around blue haired maverick. Um, and uh, before we jump in for, um, to, to the session around uh, what is the role of business in racial justice movement building? Um, I wanted to first uh, give a little bit of the sort of ground rules and housekeeping. So we also hope to be joined by Olainka Creedle, who is, uh, oh, let me see if she's, I think she made it. Let me invite her up on screen. Okay, so while Olainka is um, coming up on screen, I'll just do some brief housekeeping and logistics. So uh, many of you know, uh, have done Crowdcast, but for those of you who haven't, um, you can submit your questions in the Q uh, box at the bottom. And uh, it, the chat is more conversational. So Andrew, you could maybe post something in the chat um, just so folks can see that. And the, uh, we use the Q&A, um, you know, ask a question box because it allows us to upvote and downvote questions. So there's a question session section. Um, we also like to bring folks up on screen. Hey, Olenka. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're going to be live streaming on Facebook. Um, this event is being recorded. You can check out um, Crowdcast, the same link. You can watch the recording or you can also visit the Lift Economy channel on YouTube. And let me just mention Olenka, my dear friend. Um, she is the co-founder and CEO of Melanin Essentials. She's program director at Common Future, co-founder of the Dismantle Collective, entrepreneur, speaker, writer, and economic and racial justice activist. So welcome, Olenka. Thank you, thank you. So um, maybe pass to Andrew and wanna frame up this session, uh, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for bringing us in with all the housekeeping details. And we're so excited to have Olenka and Tiffany on the call with us today. Um, series if you're just joining the series of conversations uh today is our fifth um session in this ongoing series that we're calling the hashtag next economy movement series and in terms of how ryan and i and kevin will be joining kevin by another partner at let's economy will be joining us shortly um but just to kind of frame up our approach to this conversation and the genesis of this series um so we are approaching this conversation not really as experts. Our intention is to make this about, uh, not about us, but about all of us. And really uh, kind of the genesis of our thinking around this came from wanting to produce an online summit, but kind of wanting to tweak the models such that it's um, less of a one-way conversation. And we're actually engaging in participatory collective dialogue, um, especially at this point in time. And um, also recognizing and we're learning that um, uh, a lot about kind of facilitating an emergent process and want to just be transparent and vulnerable that um, we're learning and um, appreciate everyone's patience as we're as we support carrying this conversation to a place that really serves the movement and serves this moment so um, with that I will also just share that a little bit um, informing our why of doing this series is kind of testing the hypothesis that there is no movement of movements um, that exists right now or and or at least we're not maybe communicating as well as we could be so there's a need for some stitching together of uh, what we might call it movement infrastructure um, and our sort of question with that hypothesis is is this series an effective organizing space that can provide um, be valuable for that. And so we're excited to bring in um, voices like uh, Ola Inca's and Tiffany's. And last week we had, um, uh, I'm blanking <laughs> right now from Evolve Oakland, David Jackson um, on and uh, inviting in other really uh, people whose perspectives we really respect into the conversation to deeply inform the conversation. So hopefully that provides a bit of context for our conversation today and the, uh, how it fits in this broader series of conversations. Um, 
So I think with that, um, I will pass it back to you, Ryan. Yeah. So maybe I'll <clears throat> put my first question to you, Tiffany. Um, what is or should be the role of business in racial justice movement building? Awesome. Thank you for awesome. having me. Thank you for awesome. having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems maybe some feedback. Um, not to, it might be headphones or. Well, well, well. Mm -hmm. well, well, well. All right, all right. Okay, she's gonna switch to headphones. Wow, that was quick. I got, had it in hand already. <laughs> it was like James Bond style. Um, all right. Better. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. So thank you for having me. Was what I was saying on on an echo on a loop. And yes, I think that businesses have a unique role in as much as we're, so many of us are spending our time there and they have an outsized impact on our society. So the businesses and the economy of business has contributed in really meaningful and adverse ways to the damage that has been caused uh, that has been caused to our ecosystems, right? To our our social infrastructure, our environmental infrastructure. And so the role that I believe business plays is in course correcting some of the harm that has been caused by enterprise. So when you are, you know, responsible for the movement of millions and millions of dollars and the movement and transference of resources across the globe, doing that responsibly and doing that with the consideration of human impact, environmental impact in mind is something that is a real responsibility. So businesses, you know, before social enterprise movement and businesses kind of writ large have taken a pass and just failed to be socially, culturally and environmentally responsible. And I think that we're seeing a, a moment for reckoning. Awesome. And Olenka, you maybe the same question for you. Anything you want to expand on, or yeah, I'd be curious. Your thoughts are. Yeah, definitely. Hi, Ryan. It's so good to see you, Tiffany, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here with people that I love and respect and admire in in so many ways. Um, uh, I would say. The, the role of business really is like operating with a consciousness and an intentionality. And I've thought about this question and I'm thinking like, well, what's, what, what's their role? Like what's not their role, right? Like the opposite question, like what could they not be doing? And um, the economy is essential to the movement and racial justice. And just because you have a process doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive business. And the way that we've been operating and running businesses in, in this economy, it hasn't been working. It also, well, it has been working, right? Um, but it's only been profiting a certain people group, a certain identity. And now you look at it now and you talk to people about business and they're like, you know, well, I have, must have to be a nonprofit to, to make change. And it's like, no, like what we've been looking at as the standard to operate a business has not been it hasn't been beneficial to everyone. That's a part of the economy. So now we have to rethink business and this, this, this dawning question of, well, how should we do business? And we have to look at the fact that address these hard questions. Like, have we been operating business ethically? Um, the, oh, but you can operate a profitable business as well as an ethical business. So we have to start thinking about how we can move forward in that way and not be so shocked when a business that's ethical is off also profitable and start making that a goal, right? Until it's a normal thing, so. Really, I really love all of that. And um, I'm curious, like, I mean, even just this question that Ryan asked is so huge, right? There's so many angles that we can take this. I appreciate hearing both of your perspective. Um, my mind goes in, in, a, in a different place, um, just thinking even about like, the way that businesses are structured, right? Like that's that's one side of it that that is antithetical to 
um, you know, racial justice and um, and therefore racial justice movement building. So there's like a role from that angle of things, and also just from the side of like, um, I'm I'm going to be releasing an interview soon on the Next Economy Now podcast series with Clark Arrington, and we talk we're talking a little bit about kind of the this debate that has existed in the kind of racial justice. Uh, movement community around like seeking political power versus economic power. And I feel like there's some relationship between that and this question, but um, just based on what the both of you shared, uh, maybe I'll turn it back to you, Olayinka, what like on what you described just now, like what is an authentic commitment to that work look like? That's a good question. Um, like you said, there's so many layers to this. It's like I'm trying to figure out, like, where do you even even begin? Um, I think an authentic commitment starts with humanity um, and addressing those hard questions. Um, I was on a panel uh, recently about um, a, a year ago, and I still remember this panel because it was like a bunch of B Corps in the community that I used to live in in Lancaster. And one of the questions was like, like a lot of business owners, how do you make an ethical business and it's it's hard to answer those questions especially if you've been operating with the bottom line like you know we got to increase our profit we got to increase our capital and you ask those questions then you're like oh wow we're profitable and then you get so far into your business and then you're like wait doing this correctly so i think it's just making those small changes but first asking the very important questions and being prepared to see the truth like whatever you whatever you're numbers say your finances your um streamline uh your supply chain right all those things will tell the story so figuring out what is your story and i will say it's it was a little easier for me to start my business because i i went to seminars on social entrepreneurship so i had to make those hard choices beginning i, I made those commitments so i wasn't going to use plastics and i wasn't going to like those things that you know it costs a little bit more but it costs what it's supposed to cost we've gotten so used to those cheaper prices and those supply chains. And now we're like, oh, it's so expensive. Like, no, that's that's what you should be paying someone to create something for you if you honor their humanity, right? So it's just start with humanity. Like, what does a person need and deserve? Like, what is actual beneficial to their livelihood, their holistic health? And it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you have to ask those questions and figure out, are you doing an ethical job? in what you're paying people and how you're representing um, people in your, your your company and your work culture. Obviously, you're not gonna answer all the questions right away, but start with what is the story that your business is telling from the work culture to the finances, how you're spending your money, how you're allocating resources. That will, that will tell you exactly where you need to start and not being afraid to figure that stuff out and just making a commitment uh, to instill those changes little by little right so start with the humanity and in your company and then just address those the hearts like it, it, it's starting small but really just staying committed to it because you care about people yes i i want to echo what you're saying olenka it's people want to bite off more than they can chew they want to take everything on and that becomes overwhelming right if i feel like my role in justice and all this is is bigger than i can handle then i'm not going to take anything on and regardless of how you sh want to show up in the world, you can be amazing on the customer facing side, show up globally as all kinds of a leader and a winner. But if you're leaving behind the people who work in your organization, the people who, are, who, who make up your supply chain, then it's not authentic, it's disingenuous. So maybe you're not exploiting your customers, but you're exploiting everyone else who builds up your company that's not okay. So my advice to companies is start on the inside because you, like you don't you don't want a bunch of people inside your organization to out you as you know as hypocrites. So start on the inside and that means listening to what people need, to what people are asking for um and and not just doing whatever you want. And then the next phase of, I believe, sort of authentic engagement in these spaces is to, again, don't try to be all things to all people. Don't try to save every part of what is broken with our world, but find the intersection, for instance, between 
your industry and racial injustice. I promise you, if it's an industry on this planet, there is a, a specific manner in which BIPOC people have been exploited either historically or currently, probably both, okay? And identify those specific harms, those specific pain points, and create solutions into that space. To me, that's authentic. I don't really want to hear from a toothpaste company that is, you know, doing some random impact thing that has nothing to do with the harm that they cause and the things that I know they care about. If I know that you care about certain things and you're saying, we're going to make sure that in this space, you know, black people, indigenous people, people of color, women, you know, the, the, the underrepresented, the oppressed are taken care of in any way that touches what we already do. That's a whole different level of engagement. And Tiffany, what would you, who are, who is, do you have any names that come to mind of who's doing it right? Like many people, obviously we were joking before the call started of like putting the, a black picture, you know, blackout on your Instagram is like, did we do it? Did we solve racial justice? Um, and, you know, going to like a hashtag and a statement like Black Lives Matter at Netflix, we blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you even have Ben and Jerry talking about dismantling white supremacy and like supporting HR 40. But are there, are there examples? I'd be curious what your thoughts are on, you know, both companies are doing it right and uh, um, if that's sufficient for what we need. Yeah, so I don't have an overwhelming number of them. It would That would take more yeah. research, but I do know, for instance, of a um, a very, very wealthy school in Pennsylvania that became aware of it of, of just racial injustice in a, long before this happened right so before before the this moment and they decided to take an intentional look at their relationship to transatlantic slavery to you know the just any kind of disenfranchisement or um, abuses against in particular black people um, this particular institution kept incredibly good records and they compensated people to go through their records and they realized that there was there was some real real gnarly stuff in their history and so they took the steps necessary to expose their own engagements their own their own crimes their sins um, and to try to make restitution into those spaces. So it is about a critical examination of where we came from. Like when I heard that Brooks Brothers went out of business, I wasn't sad. Brooks Brothers made their money putting clothes on the back of enslaved Africans who had picked the cotton that turned into the clothes that they made. And it was an exploitive and gross, you know, economic economic situation that is the foundation of many of our of our corporations in this country so examining your history your past what you've done and trying to do right in this moment and beyond i believe is the most honest way forward just to build on that tiffany i think what you're saying is really uh interesting and I, like i can see that that being a very um like within a within an enterprise, very kind of internal process, and, and I guess I'm curious, like, what does that look like? So you've spoken to some of the things of how that looks like internally of examining and doing all of that stuff. I'm curious if there's kind of an element of that that ties into how businesses engage in community with other businesses or with the community in which it's nested. And curious what comes up. For well, you. I. I think that what we have to begin to do is normalize that kind of introspection, right? Why would people be hesitant? I've been doing diversity work for decades and people didn't want to do it because they don't want to expose their dirty laundry. They don't actually want to know what they're doing wrong. And they certainly didn't want to invest money into getting it right. We're now in a moment where if you didn't make a Black Lives Matter statement, then we're assuming that you're overtly racist. And if you're not backing that statement up with measurable, impactful action, then we think you're FOS, right? So now we've got a, a situation where that introspection, it's a really hard thing to do, 
but just like social enterprise sector led the way towards a different kind of business model, a different kind of economy, the companies that are willing to stand up and say, you just really can't be a company in America that is of a certain age without a messed up history. So we're gonna own it, we're gonna look at it, and we're gonna make intentionally inclusive choices moving forward. Those companies are going to be the leaders of the future. They're the ones that we're gonna look at and say, okay, you didn't try to bamboozle me with the delusion of white supremacy and pretend it didn't never happen. You owned it, you did something about it, you made community reparations, right? So breathing life and resources into the communities in which these companies are housed is, is really important. And that's, I look now at organizations on a spectrum. Before this civil rights movement, the spectrum was having a diversity statement to having a chief diversity officer. After this thing started, it was having a Black Lives Matter statement to community and individual reparations. So where's your company at on that scale? And Olenka, I wonder if you could speak to, you know, some of these issues, but also, you know, Common Future. I don't think, I don't know if many folks know Common Future and maybe some of your work you're doing there, because this all dovetails really nicely with the stuff you're doing. So could you speak a little bit about, about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I was thinking to myself, would it be biased if I said Common Future, knowing that I work there? And I was like, heck yeah, and I don't care because we got the statements and the numbers to back it up, right? Um, so, you know, from Bridge Fellows, um, a recent initiative that I uh, launched and created over the past few months, um, it, it was really like an idea like, okay, you have this, you know, opportunity to regrant for the first time in the organization's history. And I was honored to be able to have that privilege to just take that those funds and create something that really focused on, okay, who are the leaders in the communities that are doing the work and how can we provide an opportunity for them to meet each other? And, and Common Future, previously known as Bali, they all, always have fellowships. Um, but now it was an opportunity to re-grant and focus on a community that was in need um, from creating Bridge Fellows, which focuses on the South and people in the South who are, you know, in those communities doing the work, as well as um, recently uh, deploying funds. Um, within 48 hours, we committed funds to Black entrepreneurs up to $100,000 each for each organization. And we didn't say, hey, you have to fill out this long um, <laughs> application and then give us 50 hours of your time and then show us money and then come back and then give your whole lives to people for free like you know and a lot of times you see organizations that um they're basically paying for your your time your information um and i hate to say it this way but sometimes it looks like it's for show right it's just like this is what we did um and just to see our our team really just we have this fun these funds and we're gonna who we know been doing the work we don't need to ask them to um, and I'll actually uh, paste the article right here because it describes the process and what we learned from that. Um, but I would I would encourage other organizations to um, to take that leap forward. We had the funds, we've been talking about the work, and we've been doing the work. We've been studying the work, and it was just like there were, there could have been a million reasons why we didn't deploy those funds, and it was just like this is how you do it. You you take those those risks, and it, is it a risk? Not really, because we were, again we knew that the network leaders who we, you know, funded, they, they've been doing the work and they didn't need to prove that they were worthy of funds that are already hard to come by and already slim pickings for black leaders, right? Um, so if you have the opportunity, uh, don't ask yourself how to do it. Ask yourself why you should not do it. Like, right, there's, there's so many reasons why you should not do it. But the main reason is if you do it, that's really where it matters. Um, and I, another thing I'll say is um, one one quote that sticks out to me, and I heard this a lot growing up, was you give yourself the option, then you'll fail. But it's like if you only give yourself a certain amount of options and opportunities and choices, then you and those, if those choices are equitable in themselves, you're only going to succeed and learn from those choices. So to put it, it's, it's almost like if like a diet or something, right? Like you're like, oh, I just I can't eat these these bad things. It's like you won't. It's not an option. 
So don't allow certain things to be an option. It's not an option to ignore um, black entrepreneurs. It's not an option to ignore the white supremacists and oppressive systems that are in your organizations. If you make it an option, you'll make excuses. So just don't make it an option. And that's what we oh, do. Wow. That reminds wow. me of the the situation with um, people who, who say that they just can't find people of color to hire, um, but they'll accept an interview panel with seven white people on it. And so increasingly, I've been so impressed by the hiring teams, the leaders, the CEOs who say, if you don't have at least two representatives of demographics that we don't have represented in this organization or that we'd like to see more of, then we're not going to see the interview panel until you actually do the work. So I love that because you're saying constrain the choices to good choices. Mm -hmm. It's not an yeah. option. Too many people make it an option. It's just not an option anymore. Make that commitment in your organization, in your business, that it's just not gonna be an option anymore. That's great. Alenka, where, um, where is some of the work that you're involved in at Common Future heading? Like what are some of the initiatives that you're looking at moving? Cause just so folks know, Common Future is all about building an, a more inclusive economy that works for everyone. And so this is like, well, Enka's work is pretty spot on to what we're discussing today. Okay, I was, I was trying to find the mute button because the screen <laughs> like shifted. I was like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> Don't do that, Ryan. You know I'm not texting. Y'all well, get lost and just be like, start sweating. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we actually just had a meeting about this um, as an or, um, organization uh, last week about just where we're heading. Right. So like what, seven, eight months ago, we, we, we were in, uh, we had a different name. We had a, a different team and a lot of things have changed. And now we're looking at, OK, our vision is, you know, what can we do to bring an equitable and sustainable economy that works for everyone? And that means like recognizing what communities are systemically excluded um, from successful economies, right? Um, and we are hired from hiring new staff. We're, lit we're literally doing interviews to grow our team, the people who really care about, okay, what is it going to take to decrease the racial wealth gap um, to th the different programs and that we're uh, bringing up as well as the staff um, and how we are reorienting in the organization itself. Um, so we're growing like our different divisions. Um, it's, it's so many things that we're growing, but I would say one of the main things pointing out is that we're trying to figure out the two big things will evolve this shifting capital is really like important to us because, um, if you don't fund the people who are doing the work, then they can't do the work. And too many times we, we've expected people to just out of nowhere, pull out these, these opportunities to do the work without money. So shifting capital. We've already shifted $250 million towards community investment. And now we're saying, well, what would it look like to do that with $1 billion? And there's $100 billion of untapped capital that we can use into building the economy. So we have vivacious goals, but it's we're looking at it again. We're saying, like Rodney, our CEO said, this is not radical. Like, this is common sense, um, common future, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, so really shifting capital and then second, really tackling wealth inequality. So we're at that sector between racial and economic justice. That's what you'll find coming future and growing our programs and our initiatives. So if you go to our website, you'll be able to see more and more that, of what we're doing as far as like uh, different program initiatives and opportunities to join. And I'm personally on the network management team. So we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we engage people more? Even if you don't have a business, even if you don't have a nonprofit, but you care about this stuff, how can you be connected with us? Maybe you can join an online platform that we're building. So we're having all types of cool conversations um, about that. Can I just say congratulations? That's so badass. I love it. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's exactly favorite. what we need. <laughs> That's our favorite Yay. word on the team. That our team members say it all the time. <laughs> I love it. Andrew, do you, I saw a question come up in chat. You want to? Maybe pose that one or you want me to do it? I can do it. All right, I'm already, I'm already, I'm already unmuted. Um, so a few questions coming in. Um, Haley had a good one here. I'll pose this to you, Tiffany. How do you straddle the line of pushing your company to do more to fight for racial justice 
while understanding and respecting some organizations need to move at a very slow pace or need time to understand this needs to be a high priority. Yeah, so in terms of prioritization first, people signed on to work for the company. They understood what the vision and the mission was, I hope, right? The challenge with anything related to Jedi work, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, is that some people are content to believe that that part of the work is not the work, right? I got hired to do a job. I work in marketing and I'm not a justice, anti-racism worker. It is the job of leadership to communicate to all staff that this is part of who we are and this is something that we are taking on. And there needs to be no, no ambiguity and no wiggle room for particularly middle managers are the ones that become the most resistant because they've done what they've done the way that they've done it forever and it's worked. And that's not part of my job. So leadership has to make us take a stance and say, look, I know that anti-racism doesn't seem like it's core to our work, but let me show you how it is. Let me show you how as a marketing team, if you're not able to think and breathe inclusively and understand the impact of what we're producing on you know, historically oppressed communities, then let's make that link for you. So getting that buy-in is something that leadership has to do. And then there has to be a realization that everyone starts from a different place. So there are no shortcuts. There are no hacks. Um, there is no easy way to do it. If you're taking on this work and you're serious about it, that means making the investment in providing the foundation that everyone needs to be successful in acquiring new behaviors, in understanding the critical link between anti-racism and the work that we do. That's a foundation that has to be laid. If you don't start at the beginning, it gets really messy really fast and you end up wasting resources. So if you don't wanna waste millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, then you need to start at the beginning and not assume that people are starting from the same place. So we need to have shared language, shared understanding, understand you know, our history, how we got here, and why this is important to our colleagues and our, our employees, as well as the people we serve, constituencies, communities, et cetera. So trying to do it fast, do it all at once, have a massive, visible, splashy impact tomorrow, you can't do that. You gotta start at the beginning and communicate to people that this is part of the work and every bit is as important as the rest of the mission. So, go ahead, Andrew, you go for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was maybe like a bit of a non sequitur, um, the question that was coming up for me and tying back to um, something that I think Ola Inka mentioned in the earlier part of the conversation around nonprofits. But like one thing that's coming up is kind of like, does business with, um, with some of what we're talking about, does, does business sort of have a unique role in racial justice work broadly as compared to uh, nonprofits, for example, and or government, or even just at the individual level, like what does business and maybe business communities, what, like, is there a unique role to be played there um, in the space of racial justice? Yeah, Tiffany looks like you, something. Like I know, you. I'm like, can't yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so business is currently running our government, okay? So if we're talking about racial justice and how we are affecting the lives, the minds and the hearts of the people, then we need to talk about how our rules, regulations, policies, laws, et cetera, are being made, changed and interpreted. Business has the, the financial means, right? And the, and the economic power to drive politics across this country and across the world. 
So businesses sometimes like to, you know, play Switzerland and we're not going to get involved in it. Bull crap. You need to be on the right side of justice. So all these companies that put out a Black Lives Matter statement need to be actively supporting politics with ethics, need to be actively wielding that economic power and saying, we're not going to stand for the continued abuse of Black people. We're not going to continue to stand for the continued oppression of Indigenous peoples. And if that's what we see, we're going to pull our finances, full stop. They're very good at wielding that power when it comes to pushing their own agendas. So social justice, anti-racism needs to become central to the corporate agenda. Yeah, I, I love that, Tiffany. Um, us millennials, we say, keep that same energy. That's what we say. Seriously, if you can, if you can find a way to do it for all these other causes and initiatives, you'll figure out a way to do it if you really care about dismantling those systems within within your organizations or businesses. And a lot of times we think about, you know, nonprofits and we think like they're the ones that's supposed to solve these problems. Whereas you have this untapped capital and economy that's really focused on that, you know, bottom line and forget the quadruple bottom line, the bottom line. Um, and just to go, I, I want to go back to your comment as well, Andrew, because you mentioned like, what would someone say if they're not there and everybody starts somewhere, but let's recognize that ignoring racial justice advocacy or economic justice, that's privilege. Like if you can wake up and just decide you don't want to do anything about it, it's because your life is not affected by it, right? So recognize the privilege in that and realize, okay, then if it doesn't affect me, if I can live a life and not be concerned about it, then that must mean that I have some sort of privilege where I can address this in my, my work and my organizations. The first thing that I do when I'm working with any organization or company like I, act, you have to ask yourself, like, where has this work or industry been extracted by white supremacy? And I ask that question all the time because you you won't find an industry that has not been affected, extracted by white supremacy. You just won't. Um, so make that assumption when you start the work, and the answer will vary. Obviously, some institutions were created off the backs and in of white supremacy, whereas some were just benefiting off of it, not unintentionally. But the impact is still there, regardless of what the intent was for your organization or how you started your company. Um, so the work is there and how you answer that question is going to vary from business to business. But as long as you're seeking to answer that question is really what's important there, too, as well. Yeah, there's I want to speak to this, that, that asking the, the, the right questions. Mm -hmm. There is no universal way to get this right. Right. If one of us had identified the answer then everybody would be getting it right. It is as unique to each individual organization as that organization is to the world, right? No two organizational cultures are the same because they're made up of different bodies, different souls. And it is the deprioritization of those bodies, of those human spirits within the organization that is part of the imbalance, right? So recognizing that there's sanctity in the body of people who are working with you is something that's so important. And so when people are like, okay, Black Lives Matter, let's hire a bunch of black people. We're gonna be 50-50, black and white. Well, if your company is housed in the middle of Iowa, where are you gonna get 50% black people? And if black people make up 13% of the American population, you are over indexing for, for blackness and you are setting yourself to fail when, when that's not a necessary thing. So you've got to be clever about the things that you're asking about the benchmarks that you're creating. What is the demographic population makeup within the area that you are, that you're, that you're situated, right? If you, if your company has a national footprint, then maybe the national demographics are a good benchmark to start with, but don't try again to shortcut it or to just, throw random numbers out there and aim for them. Think about what makes sense for what you do, where you are and who you're affecting. Yeah, you know, Tiffany, one thing I've heard, you may have mentioned this to me because we did co-author a book together, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, folks often want to go out and hire 
to make their team more diverse. Um, but there's a lot to be said for how do you dismantle the systems, the like unconscious systems already in your company that are preventing folks of color from even wanting to work there in the first place? Or if they, if you do hire folks of color, like, is it like the environment that's set up for them to thrive? Um, so can you speak a little bit about like, how do you slow people down and be like, all right, let's do some, let's do some analysis, maybe maximize what is the diversity already that exists? Like, can you speak a little bit about that like layer? Yeah. Person? So that is uh, what happens when people start with the symptom, right? We don't have enough people of color, so let's just hire people of color. Well, pump the brakes. If you don't optimize your container for inclusive behavior, you're going to get what is known as the BIPOC uh, revolving door, right? You'll hire some people in that represent demographics that you don't have a lot of, and they will be out that door just as fast as they came in, right? And you don't want that press. You don't want to be the organization that just can't keep people of color. But that's what happens if your culture is not trained and educated on how to respond to genuinely inclusive diversity, right? Because if you hire my black tail with the blue hair and you don't let me talk and you don't understand that when I flail my arms around and my eyebrows are up here and I'm moving my head, I'm not angry, I'm engaged. I care about what we're doing right now. If you interpret my communication style as angry black woman, and start having all kinds of feels and getting in your in your in your head and in your feelings about about how I show up. That's going to make me feel like I don't belong, and I'm going to go seek somewhere else that's more welcoming. So people need to understand how to deal with and respond to uh, divergent views. Right, the best of diversity. It's not just about social justice. It's about when you invite. I have five intersectional identities. So if you give me a problem and I ruminate on it and I provide you with solutions, I'm bringing the best of a multilingual, invisibly disabled, queer, non-binary black person to the table. Do you think my solutions are going to sound like the same 72 Ivy League white male solutions that have been proposed previously? No, they won't. But if you haven't authentically invited me to join the culture and created space for me to exist in my personal freedom, you'll never get the best out of me. You'll get blue hair and brown skin on your annual report picture or whatever you put on your website, but you won't actually benefit from the diversity. And we can just send it right there. We can just send it. <laughs> <laughs> this was so great. Thanks everyone. Wow. Like, wow. Wrap it up. <laughs> Maybe okay. this was, po this was, and then Andrew, if you want to um, jump in, like this has been sort of a, like one of the ending questions that I want to move up to make sure we get to this. Olenka, are you, how are you feeling about like what's going on now? So we had a lot of protests, you know, after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, and there's not as much people on the street. Um, and so like, I'm just, what is your gut sense of like, is this, is the work still happening, but it's like in the policy level and it's like in city council meetings, are you feeling optimistic, pessimistic? I'm just kind of, what's your general take on, on this right now? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I just tweeted actually that I cannot rest until they, mur they uh, arrest the cops who murdered Breonna Taylor. And I don't think people understand just how serious we are. Like, I hope that I'm not fighting this fight, this specific fighting this fight until I die, but I will, I will. And this is just one instance. This is just one case. Actually, my good friend, Leslie Red uh, Redmond, um, the president of NACP chapter, she was actually one of the people that was arrested and, um, we had a good conversation and she just, one thing that really stuck to me was, you know, I did arrested before the cops who murdered Breonna Taylor did. And that's just like how wonky ironic. Um, and I, I just, that's literally on my mind every day amongst multiple things that I address.
I think about and I deal with. Um, and you have this has to be dealt with on it, like it's a systematic thing, right? So we talk about like dismantling white supremacy and oppression and injustice, and it has to happen from so many different levels, like government, business, policy, and this idea that what does business role have to play? Like, and it's like huge, like Tiffany said. I, I my first job out of college was working on the Hill, and I'll never forget there was this huge group of people every day coming to my office and they were lobbying. Uh, it was a dairy industry. And I thought it was really interesting because I'm personally plant-based um, and there was a huge decline in dairy sales, but they, they like dominated the the press releases, the, the meetings, and they just put so much money into lobbying for their business and for laws that benefited their sales to increase their sales. Um, so make no mistake, business is directly involved in government. And this this fight is going to be continuous. And I don't think in my lifetime, I'll see the issue solved. But the fact that the racial wealth gap is continuing to increase, that means that, I mean, all this work, sometimes it, feel, it feels discouraging because I'm like, is anything actually changing? Like, seriously, is anything actually changing? Because it, it's hard to, it's, you're doing all this work. And you look at the numbers and you see the, the racial wealth gap and you see the the, the gap of families of wealth. And you just look at that and you say, so what is actually happening? Where is my money going? And I think it's because of the players, the people who have the money and the people who are benefiting from the systems just don't want to give it up. And you don't need me, people like me and Tiffany to, to, to lead these conversations like you should be able to host those conversations. If you have an all white organization, you should be able to have those conversations and figure out where you need to make that change. And the fight is gonna continue. People are gonna continue to do the work. But one question I will pose to people of color that I heard um, from a, a ma amazing woman, Anasa Troutman um, from Memphis. And she said, someone posed this question to me and I've been trying to answer it. What would I be doing if I wasn't fighting white supremacy? You know what I would be doing? I would be dancing full time and I would be writing my poetry and I'll just wake up in the sun and blog. And there's people who are afforded that lifestyle because they don't have to worry about this. You're forced into this lifestyle to fight for justice because you wake up and you realize the world isn't just and it's not created for my benefit or my success. Like, so I am, I'm optimistic that my people will continue to fight, but I'm pessimistic about those who are not, who benefit from privilege. I'm pessimistic that they really, really want to change because I can see them make changes for, for a lot of other things and throw cash and billions of dollars into so many campaigns that will put money back into their pockets. Um, that's, that's just my view. Ola Inke, are you, are you familiar with pleasure activism? I'm not, but I have gotten into, um, I know, but I have gotten into um, this app uh, that does like uh, racial justice meditations lately. Yes. And it has been so awesome. Okay. Your, your homework, your assignment, <laughs> should you be willing to accept it? Like I'm, I'm so excited to hear that you're a millennial because I can't, I'm not going to do this forever and a day. And I'm so happy that the next generation coming up behind has this energy and this life, but uh, baby girl, if I can yeah. give you one thing, mm -hmm. I am doing both of those things. I am fighting for racial justice every single day and I'm waking up in the sunshine and I'm dancing every day and I am living my best life alongside because I you're need right. to get there. The delusion of white supremacy created a world that is not oriented towards our pleasure and our yeah. happiness and our success. And so we must claim every single moment of joy that we can extract mm -hmm. from this lifetime you can yeah. still do the work like yeah. you can still do the work but it is your it is your birthright to claim that happiness anywhere that you can as long as you aren't causing harm you go get your happiness girl because <laughs> that's what's going to give you the resilience to do this and i come from generations and generations of people who've been doing versions of this work in their own way you i need you to dance every day I need yeah. you to find a little spot of sunshine and lay in it because it is it is embodying that freedom that re will remind you in an even more palpable way of what you are fighting for and mm -hmm. why you are fighting for it. And and those who would look up to you and those who you are, who you will liberate through your work, 
need to see you embodying that freedom and that joy. So I believe that both are possible. I am equally optimistic about the energy of the movement right now and, and, and what I'm seeing us do. But I always considered the work that I did cathedral building work. I never thought I would see the seismic shift. I stood on the back, on the, on the shoulders of, of, of the giants who came before us and figured that we would be laying another layer of foundation. But I am optimistic about what's possible because the difference between this movement and what we've seen before is a critical mass of allies who've woken up in a different kind of way. Because even the most liberal woke people, you know, white mm. folks who thought they got it, there's a difference between yeah. understanding racism intellectually, academically, cerebrally, and having your heart broken open after watching a man lynched on your screens, large and small. There isn't that is and feeling racism, right? And for many people, for the first time, watching it and feeling it in your heart is a very different exercise than the academic exercise. So the the, the seismic shift is upon us, and I really do believe that we're at a turning point, an inflection point that will uh, that will usher in a new day. Because do you think? The black people go go back to work after the pandemic and be like, go ahead and treat us like crap. We were loving that. <laughs> <laughs> we just we just gonna sit down and take it. Mm-hmm. I doubt it. I highly doubt it. And there are enough allies marching mm-hmm. with us, speaking with us, learning how to use their words and use their superpowers of privilege yeah. in service of a greater world. So my optimism is manifold, manifest, and it is there, but for the the cl- clenching on to that joy that I'm able to keep that attitude because no one's going to take it from me. Absolutely. Strong recommendation from Tiffany Jana to read Pleasure yes, Activism, y'all. I'm going to. I just added it. I just <laughs> typed it in on my notes. Adrian Marie Brown, Pleasure Activism. Yeah, that's Thank huge. Thank you so much. And uh, I think maybe that's a nice segue to kind of, <clears throat> we have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes remaining for today. And uh, I think one thing that I could kind of see you pointing there to Tiffany is, is that the, the, the spirit of the moment and all of the energy that is, um, you know, behind both like the racial justice movement kind of unto itself. And similarly in this space of the conversation that we're having now, like that economic space in business and so on and so forth. But like, with that moment that we're in right now, um, curious, who are you seeing that sort of doing some of that stitching of movement infrastructure, finding overlaps, finding common ground and um, moving forward these conversations? So Adrienne Marie Brown right now is is my whole personal hero. Right. So she wrote, uh, in addition to pleasure activism, she wrote emergent strategy. And I like I just personally I've never met her I've never talked to her but I feel so uh, such a kindred connection with her because we actually have a lot of like so many overlapping like identities and experiences and like army brat and all this stuff um, but what I see in her work is this deep desire to do exactly that the the acknowledgement of that intersection of movements and the necessary integration of these conversations I because what I think that part of what what pulls them apart is we, we do, we get a lot of unfortunate ego driven um, mentality, right? So people who are, you know, focused more on the publicity than on the movement itself. Um, and people just get kind of stuck in, in their path to solution. I think that, you know, one of the things that's awesome about the work that Olaenka and I do is that, you know, when you're working in these spaces, you become incredibly comfortable with the uncomfortable, you become familiar with the ambiguous, right? And so I think that in some of the movement spaces, you know, we've just decided that this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And our faction is going to do it this way. And we don't want to hear from you. And it's like, there is no template. There is no codified template for success that is absolutely 100% guaranteed to work. And so in addition to reading Pleasure Activism, I highly recommend Emergent Strategy because Emergent Strategy is all about building the plane while flying figuring out the problem while you are navigating the, 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 the challenges. So there is, I think there's great late leadership coming out of that emergent strategy movement and the folks who are anyone who's willing to 
um, you know, not disparage and not sort of displace other leaders and other movements who are doing things, but what willing to understand that there is enough for all of us and that the liberation of any of us is part of the liberation of all of us. So good. Um, maybe Olenka, any, maybe same question, like who's stitching together movements? Um, where, where do you see that like infrastructure being built? Like who's most inspiring to you on that level? Yeah, that's a, that's good. Um, I would say one word that's been coming to mind for me specifically is liberation. It's funny you just said that, Tiffany, because that's what I was going to answer and say is uh, trying to focus on the liberation of communities and people and autonomy and and giving people the, the the liberation and the freedom and the spirit of individualism to be able to solve issues that are most pressing to them, their families and their communities. Um, do you like, and it's funny because I'm thinking about in, in Dismantle Collective and how we exist to dismantle white supremacy, but we've been talking a lot about liberation, like, and that, that's our guiding star. Like, what does it mean to, to be free? And you know when you don't feel free, when you're not at peace, when you can't sleep, when you don't have joy, when you're tired. Um, and there's a heavy burden on people of color um, in indigenous communities where they don't have that sense of oneness and freedom and individual, individualism. Um, so make space for people to be free. No one wants to be, you know, oppressed and no one that that's not living that's not life that's not humanity um so the nap ministry is another good um movement i love them yes therapy for black girls um there's just so many movements that's just coming to my head and i'm like oh my god i'm gonna miss some people i'm gonna forget some people but just to start seeking how can you liberate your brothers and sisters and humanity how can you liberate all of us all and this people. is the that that I mean, pleasure activism at its core definition is liberation through joy, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why each of us individually claiming that joy becomes so important yeah. because it's from, from the own joyful explosion of your heart space that mm -hmm. liberating other people, like people, I'll, I'll liberate people with my blue hair. You sure do. I'm out, I'm out here being a boss and showing people that you can do with it. You can get away with charging people millions of dollars for your services with a whole head of blue hair. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So we your gotta freedom, claim it. Your freedom a lot of, gives permission for other people to, to be free. My favorite author, Maya Angelou, um, just, you know, like liberation. Like yes. it's a simple principle, liberation. And if you and others around you are not free, you're not free period, as we say in my generation. There we can end it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, before we do that, let's, folks want to know more about where they can learn about each of you. Like, if you want to speak about where can folks um, web, like where can people learn more about Common Future or any of the work you're up to? Yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. You can just go to my website, olayinkacradle.com. My bio, you'll have a link to comment. I do so much, so it's like, how do I just put people olaincacradle.com, you'll see um, the, my work with Common Future and it'll go directly to Common Future's website. You'll see my own business, Dismantle Collective, and all the things that I'm doing to for my the collective liberation of people around me. You'll find it all there. And Tiffany, what about you? Uh, Where can folks? Yeah, so I just put, uh, Tiff Tiffany, John, Instagram is where I'm the most active, but I am on all social media. So Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, my company is TMI Consulting. And so tmiconsultinginc.com is where my, my business work lives. But uh, uh, I think that there is a, if you go to my Instagram, link in bio will give you everything you never wanted to know about what I'm doing. <laughs> Same social media as well. You'll see all that. Moment. Yeah. And Google. Oh my gosh. Please don't put my name into Google because then you're going to be mad at me because you went 37 pages deep. <laughs> <laughs> I will say. You can find YouTube videos of Tiffany reading children's stories, which I'm excited about because I have a three and a five year old nice. and I didn't even know that. Inclusive until. children's stories, inclusive, inclusive children's stories. So oh, yes, I follow be, my I YouTube. Yes, Yay. children as well, yay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much to you both, Olenka and Tiffany. Um, really appreciate you both joining. Uh, you know, for folks 
again, check out uh, you know Instagram, all the all the links. Andrew, thank you for putting those in the chat. Um, you know, we can keep this conversation going in the chat after this session. You can watch the recording on uh, Crowdcast or YouTube. And then um, our next session is sometime in August. Let me check. <laughs> it's the uh, Andrew. Do you know when our next session is? Oh my gosh, can't find it on the calendar. We'll we'll put it out. Oh wait, it's 18th. Really great, really great seamless promotion there. But um, yeah, so August 18th. Thank you all for joining. Um, talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.